Hi, my name is Dennis. I'm, I'm a Solutions Architect Lead for the ASEAN Emerging Markets, and I'm from um, Amazon Web Services. And in this session, we'll be going through um, some of the um, experiences that we've had when we've dealt with public sector customers with regards to their digital transformation and cloud adoption. So um, um, as an agenda, we'll be going through what um, public customers are looking for and then our public sector customers are looking for and uh, the, the digital transformation in relation to what we term as the cloud journey. So if you have seen a couple of AWS or AWS presentations, you might have heard of the cloud journey. So we will be going through that again in relation to digital transformation and the things that you would need if you would want to sort of go through that journey. So let's go through what public sector customers are, are, are looking for. Um, so why do they go through that digital transformation? Why do they go through that cloud journey? So the, we, we do have a lot or, or we do hear a lot of um, um, reasons for customers in doing so. It could range from, say, agility and um, staff productivity. So they would want to be more productive. They would want to be uh, more agile in a sense that they would be able to react to, let's say, um, um, scenarios or, or quickly to scenarios, scenarios or situations. Uh, of course, we've heard a lot of cost, um, heard a lot about cost reduction. Again, that's sort of tied to data center consolidation as well, where they feel that maintaining, say, a data center does not make sense for them because maybe they don't really have the skill set or they wouldn't want to spend a lot of time in trying to maintain a, a data center. Um, on the extreme side, of course, we do have customers or public sector customers looking into AI ML. So those are cutting edge technologies and it's easy it was easier for them to um, get hold of those capabilities ai uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence and machine learning by say subscribing um through cloud services and of course digital transformation is there as well so digital transformation in a public sector um, scenario it could range from let's say coming up with smart cities or in the education space that could be research or the next generation learning management systems. Um, and of, of course, um, community impact with regards to citizen services. So if let's say a, gov a government agency would want to put up a website to disseminate information, yeah, of course they would want to make sure that it's highly available, meaning it's accessible 24 by seven, seven days a week. And um, the user experience with the citizens will be enjoying um, uh, a very good experience when accessing it through, let's say, um, a website. And um, so, so as I've mentioned, many customers have gone through that journey, and the results, in fact, vary. So different customers report of different benefits that they get, um, and it's of course aligned to what they would want to achieve in the first place. So for customers who are looking into cost optimization or cost savings, so customers like General Electric, they were able to realize a 50, 52 percent reduction in terms of TCO. Other customers are looking into the availability space, meaning, no, I would want my application to be up and running. I would want it to be highly available so that my citizens are able to um, get information whenever they would want it. So in the case of 2C2P, another customer, um, they were able to increase the SLAs from 99.7 to 99.999. So those numbers, in fact, translate to the number of minutes that the system can be allowed to go down in a particular month. But in this case, they were able to increase that um, high availability SLA. Um, okay, so going through that journey that, that I've mentioned earlier, um, moving to the cloud is not something that you do overnight. So we call it a journey because you start off from somewhere and it doesn't have to be big. Um, it can be like um, moving development or test environments and then slowly moving to different workloads. It could be analytics. It could be... Um, uh, mobile applications, and then eventually go through the bigger stuff that could be um, data center migration until you get um, to, you know, all in into AWS. But as I've mentioned, that's not going to happen overnight. There are usually steps in going through that journey. And something that I would want, of course, to highlight is if you look at the graph, it's a series of ups and downs in the curve uh, because it's a series of optimizations and experimentation. So there would be times where you get you you obviously see the benefit 
uh, uh, of moving to the cloud. But there are cases where you would want to try out new things and experiment. And experimentations might not lead to the desired results that you want. But the important thing here is once you go down your, or you go to a negative trajectory, you have to go um, you know, as quickly as possible moving to an, to an upward or positive trajectory. So that's what the journey would look like. Okay, so what are the components? How do you, what do I need to bring? How do I need to prepare for that um, cloud journey? Um, first and foremost, the, uh, what we feel is very important or what we have observed with our customers is customers who have or who have, um, let's say, adopted a culture of cloud found it a lot easier to move to the cloud or to go through that journey. So the culture of the cloud goes through hand in hand with the different elements, let's say, cloud first policy, security and compliance, uh, procurement vehicles, skills development, and the scaling and, uh, and, and, and um, doing things in scale and um, uh, scale with scale and speed. Um, so the culture of cloud cuts across the different components and I'll be going through um, some of them. So um, as part of the culture of cloud, one of the things that you um, that that customers um, get to sort of uh, adjust to is if you want to increase innovation, you have to lower the cost of failure. So it implies that you will fail, but um, and well, everything is bound to fail anyway. But the more important thing is you you um, lower the cost of that failure, cost in terms of time, so you quickly recover, or cost as in monetary cost or time cost or manpower cost. But I guess expect to have that those failures but the objective is not to eliminate them but in fact to um, bring down their costs such that once you get that neg negative impact you have a quick means or mechanisms to be able to recover quickly so if you would map that to the graph that you saw earlier so the downside has to go up as quickly as possible another thing that um we we sort of practice as well uh, as part of the uh, culture of cloud in amazon we always work backwards from the customer so what does that mean of course you would need to identify your customers in a government scenario that could be your citizens that could be your staff or that could be a segment of the community or that could be students working backwards from the customer is understanding what the customer needs and then eventually mapping that to the technology that satisfies that requirement. It's not the other way around. So um, this is a quote from Jeff Bezos in his 2016 letter to the shareholders. So customers are always beautifully, wonderfully dissatisfied. So interesting quote. Even when they don't know it, customers want something better. And your desire to delight customers will drive you to invent on their behalf. So once you get into the mindset of trying to help customers, not just, you know, this technology is nice and cool, let's, let's put it forward. But if you put the customers front and center, um, that's how it should be. And that's um, the way or that's, that's how you should do it in your cloud journey. So if you would look at the different elements below, what is the citizen need? That's the first question you need to ask. And then you set the goals and then identify the right technology. It's not the other way around. Find the technology and let's go for a citizen need that would require this technology. So we always work backwards from our customers. So once you've got that those requirements, you talk, you 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 um sort of got the feedback, you identified what your your stakeholders or in this case your citizens need, then you have to come up with a digital roadmap. This is a good start. So basically, you make a statement. This is what we are aiming for, and this is a good start for us to um do that journey or do that digital transformation because with every journey there has to be a goal or an end or an end point or an end to that to do you know something that you would want to achieve then that's that what what your um digital roadmap should be clear about or should include so um again going back to the best practices and things that we've learned when we were engaging with our public sector customers, specifically the government, our cloud-first policies. So what are cloud-first policies? So these are guidelines that the government set um, so that the other agencies, whether that's ministries, agencies, or government units, have something to, to look into or a reference that they can use. How do I go about in um, going to the cloud? Is this the right path? Right. So what am I supposed to gain? What are the benefits? So the cloud-first policies would outline these are the benefits that you would be getting 
if you go cloud first. And these are the things that you won't be getting if you, let's say, stick to the traditional way of how we do things, right? So the cloud first policy should be concise. It should be able to tell you or guide the, the government units on the procedures, the path, um, and policies that they would need to look into for them to continue that cloud journey. So as with most of our presentation, there's always a security component um, in it because in AWS, security is job zero. So we always make sure that we take care of the security and we, sure, we make sure we are compliant and we protect the privacy of our customers or stakeholders. Um, but, but having said that, um, we always emphasize that security is a shared responsibility model. AWS will take care of the security of the cloud um, while the customers take care of security in the cloud. It's very important because um, a lot of customers might think, so again, um, lessons learned, uh, let's put it in, 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 in the cloud and automatically it should be secure. To a certain degree, yes. Um, but the thing is, there are components where AWS does not have visibility on. Right, so whatever you put in the cloud as part of our security um, um, model is we do not see any configuration, any activity that you do in the cloud. That's part of our um, security mechanisms, right? But of course, as an effect, we wouldn't know or we wouldn't see if there are things that you need to improve in your application or in your system to make it more secure. Uh, but having said that, it's not like we're... Um, or we, we, we just let you be and, and not guide you on how to secure your applications. Of course, we would be pro uh, providing uh, best practices. Let's say deploying particular applications in the cloud. These are the things that you would need to consider. And, but at the end of the day, if let's say the guidelines say um, you would probably need encryption, for example, at the end of it, at the end of the day, you would need to enable the encryption. AWS will not enable that encryption uh, encryption feature for you. So that's how the shared responsibility model is when you're going to the cloud. Um, things to note as well, if you are looking into that, um, or pub if you're a public sector customer looking into that uh, cloud journey, is data privacy. So um, Data privacy countries would usually have what they call um, data privacy acts or data privacy laws or policies that they use. In the case of Malaysia and the Philippines, we do have those. And the thing is, again, mapping to the working backwards, uh, the data privacy is what we use as guidelines to map the different security features or services that we would be putting forward as a solution to whatever requirement you have. So the data privacy policies, those are the things that we use to be able to map our services or features to do to the requirements that you might have in any application that, who, that would require such data privacy protections. Right, so for data classification, this is again something that we have observed. It makes it easier for our customers to be able to secure their data if they understand the data. Right, so the data could be segregated, classified, or categorized into different tags or labels, and it makes it easier because um, instead of you trying to, let's say, pouring all of the security um, features and services in everything, um, having um, cat uh, classifications enables you to say, okay, um, for official um, type of data, then maybe we need A, A and B security features for secret A, B, and C, and for top secret A to Z, right? So those are the things that you can easily decide on if you have data classification in place. It's frugal, it's efficient, and it, it in fact helps uh, because um, government units would just look into the, the data classification and then immediately they would sort of have an idea or get to know these are the security features that I would need my cloud uh, provider to, to, to have for me to comply with the Data Privacy Act or policies or, or, or uh, laws that is being enforced in my country. So once we've had the cloud first policy, once we have the data classification and we have identified and we have identified who the customers are and what they need, then that's the time we are able to meet um, or map the different security services to what they in fact need, whether that's um, data residency, whether they want encryption, whether it complies with the um, data privacy acts or data uh, privacy policies of the country, that's the time we now put in, uh, put in the technology 
to sort of address those security requirements. Now, a common question, of course, asked when dealing with public um, with public sector customers is, is AWS secure? And of course, as an AWS employee, as I would say, of course, I would say yes, uh, but I'm an AWS employee. So you don't have to take my word for it. We have different institutions that attest that yes, the infrastructure that you're using with AWS is in fact secure. Whether you are looking into GDPR, ISO, SOC, HIPAA, or PCI, those are institutions that we got the stamp of approval. Yes, AWS is secure. Right, so something that makes it easier and in some cases might be necessary um, if you are looking into that cloud journey in a government, let's say, institution, is, uh, would be procurement vehicles. The vehicles could be um, the policy that, or the guidelines on how to procure cloud services. And the second um, component to that would be the platform that you might be using. It could be like an e-commerce platform that is um, specifically for the government. So as an example, I'm putting in AWS Marketplace because uh, with AWS Marketplace, AWS customers can just go to a single place, a portal where they can check what are what's available and if i have this requirement how do they map to my requirements and the different services are there i click i choose and then it kicks off a process of procurement for me so with those in place um based on feedback these are things that would make it a lot easier if these the um, these things are in place so again is the policies for the procurement itself and um any mechanism that you can use um to be able to um present or to, to provide a portal or, or a place where your government units can go to and get the services that they, um, they, they need. So uh, again, another thing that is worth considering uh, uh, would be skills development. So um, yeah, we do have a lot of cloud services, but it takes a while. I mean, you need to learn how they work and how they, they, they fit into your application or how the applications use it. It's it, it's different from what you what you you're typically used to. Like for example, you could be used to let's say setting up a database, uh, managing the storage, managing the network, and all. But that's not necessarily true when you go to a cloud environment. So you need to learn learn those things. What do I need to do? What do what are the things that I don't have to do, right? And with those, the skills um are required in doing so. We have like programs like AWS Academy educate and, and a bunch of trainings that will help um, government staff to be able to take on the roles of let's say managing looking monitoring a cloud environment so um, we have all those for knowledge transfer as well and of course we do have solutions architects that will help you out if you have quick questions but then again of course you would want to invest in training because um, in the long run it will definitely benefit your government agency so if if say I have decided, well, let's go to the cloud, but I have existing applications that I would want to move to the cloud. And these are different applications. They range from legacy applications to three-tier applications, maybe package applications or um, commercial off-the-shelf offerings. So how do, I move, uh, how do I go about in doing so? So there must be a migration strategy or journey that is tied to your cloud journey as well. So uh, you can look into the different phases um, it's a process, so you do your assessment first. What are my applications? What are its limitations? Can this be, can, can I just transfer this immediately to the cloud, like a lift and shift kind of um, methodology? Or do I need to re-platform, re-architect? Um, or do I just need to just leave it there until it, it, it gets the commission? So that's where you start assessing what you have. And then you start to mobilize. Based on what you've assessed, you mobilize on the necessary tools, people, um, and services that you would require, including the time, to be able to do the execution. And once you have mobilized all of those, you go to the migration and modernization stage. So it's iterative, meaning different applications. We may have, may, you may need to do it once, twice to be able to tune and optimize. That is tagged to the earlier graph that I show uh, um, that I showed you where you can do optimizations and experimentations until you, you're satisfied on the performance or on the gains that you're getting or you, the, the benefits that you get when you move to the cloud. If you're interested in that um, uh, program, so that's the migration acceleration program, you can scan the QR code uh, on, the, on the slide and it should lead you to our website and you'll get everything that you would want to know 
uh, with regards to the to the program. Uh, but having said that, it's not just a migration acceleration program. We do have have a lot of tools or or um, things that you can look into. So in this case, the cloud adoption framework or the cloud endure migration program. So both of which will give you guidelines and best practices of how you can move your um, application to, to the cloud, but at the same time will suggest tools that you can use in doing so. So we have SSDU. So this is Smart Selangor Delivery Unit in Malaysia, and they've started their cloud journey by moving their citizen e-payment plat platform into the AWS. Having done so, they were able to sort of lower their costs from 40 to 70%. And uh, within our region as well, um, and, and in relation to the community impact or citizen services that I've mentioned earlier, Thailand, in fact, um, well, DEPA in Thailand ran their applications, their, their COVID initiatives uh, on AWS. Okay, so you have heard of a couple of applications that move to, to AWS, but you might be thinking, so do I need to move everything to, to AWS? The answer there is no. It's not an all or nothing kind of um, question. So it's not like I move like 10, 10 applications into the cloud or not move at all. You can, again, it's a journey. You can go pick, remember the assessment uh, stage we did earlier. You can pick which ones are easier to move. Um, and you do that, you pick those, you move to the cloud and then immediately reap the benefits. You don't have to wait. Uh, for all the applications to be cloud ready or be able to be um, migrated before you reap the benefits, so it's not it's not all or nothing. You can choose applications that you would want to move to to um, to AWS. Um, so we have tools available like Cloud Endure. If you're already using VMware, we have VMware on AWS. So it sort of um, reduces the learn or the 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 the, the, the learning curve. It's not as hard because with VMware and AWS, if you're already familiar with VMware, you can make use of VMware. And lastly, we have Outpost. So Outpost is, um, it's it's effectively, or it's like bringing AWS on-premises. So the same infrastructure that we use in our regions, we bring it on-premises. So it's fully managed. And, and um, so AWS still takes care of the underlying hardware. Um, and also, if you're trying to 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 um, create cloud resources, it's the same interface or console that you would use as if you were using the AWS um, console. So um, you don't have to learn another tool because it's exactly the same tool that you use. It's just that the underlying infrastructure is um, a mix of things in the region and um, on premises in your data center. Again. Um, Within the region SF, uh, within the region, um, Cat Telecoms, in fact, chose um, AWS Outpost as an enabler for their digital uh, digital transformation. So they were looking for a consistent um, hybrid cloud experience, and Outpost was able to provide uh, them with that. So they had applications that require or that they would prefer to store uh, or process on premises, and Outpost was. Um, uh, enable them to satisfy that requirement. Outpost is just one of the offerings that we have, but the cloud continuum, if you would if you would require it in your digital transformation and in your cloud journey, um, we do have offerings like uh, those in the region itself. So for most cases, a lot of customers see that um, once they start using the cloud, they're able to transition or move and see that it's easier to in fact run it on the re uh, in the region. We do have customers who, who felt that I think I can only run a portion of my my um, workload in the cloud. But as they, they work on that small portion, they suddenly realize, hey, by the way, I think we can run the other portions as well. So most cases, in fact, go to the AWS region. There would be cases where, like in the case of Cat Telecoms, um, that they would require things on premises. So that's why there's Outposts. You can make use of that one if you're looking into low latency um, access to your applications by running it on premises. And also, there are applications that would require, let's say, gathering information or monitoring, putting sensors in remote locations, but you would still need those data and have it processed as part of, let's say, an analytical uh, project that you're doing. So we do have those, we have features or offerings 
for edge computing, whether it's IoT, whether it's moving data using our Snow, uh, Snow family. Um, and it takes it, that, that sort of makes up the um, cloud continuum from the regions to on-premises to edge computing. So uh, just to give you a snapshot of the different public sector customers or customers that we have who move or who have started the journey. In fact, a lot of them are still doing the journey and doing the optimizations. They're still doing the experimentations. These are the people that are slowly reaping the benefits of moving to the cloud. Some of them, and this is just a snapshot or a tip of the iceberg because these are the ones who agreed to be referenceable, but we do have a lot of government agencies doing the digital transformation because they understand that moving to the cloud is the right thing to do in a sense that they would uh, get the benefits of the flexibility, um, the cost savings, um, the, the um, as illustrated in the first few slides that I've shown earlier. All right, so as a summary, um, digital transformation is a journey. Uh, you, you start off at one point, you define the requirements, you work with the customers very closely or your stakeholders, in this case, the citizen, what do they need to do? And you don't have to do that overnight. You don't have to satisfy that overnight. But what's important is you have that roadmap and then you work through that and you traverse that cloud journey doing the optimizations and uh, experimentations. The culture of cloud is also important. You need the mindset to do so. So you need to let go of some practices that you typically do when you're maintaining your data sensors on-prem because it will only make it harder for you once you, uh, once you traverse or you go through that journey. Uh, also, understand the procurement and security policies. At the end of it, it has to be tied what is what is doable, what is not doable as prescribed by the, by the rules and regulations in my country. So it's important to understand how the procurement goes and what security policies do I need to be able to make this acceptable to, to my government or to my institution. And lastly, it, cloud is not all or nothing. So you can start up small. We, in fact, we do um, encourage you to experiment whether you run it in a small development environment just to see or get your get um, you know get a taste of how it's like to, to manage cloud and eventually you grow that until you are comfortable and then you have developed that culture of cloud and then you're ready to move slowly to 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 the cloud so that's that was it uh, again I would like to thank you my name is Dennis um, I'm a solutions architect lead from the ASEAN emerging markets